a, a peek at the 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 advent of Tibetan in world history. So uh, starts from the Yarlung Valley. That's where the the Tibet, old Tibetan empire sort of spread from. Seems to re have replaced earlier languages, including maybe most famously Zhangzhong, which was spoken in uh, what's now Western Tibet. And then there are two languages, uh, Tibeto-Burman languages, preserved in uh, in fragments in the uh, library cave at Dunhuang um, that also, let's say, show that uh, more languages were spoken on the Tibetan plateau in those days. The alphabet was invented in 650, that's pretty clear. The oldest uh, currently available text is the Zhol inscription, which is a pillar that sits outside the Patala Palace, uh, although that's not its original location. It was moved there by the fifth Dalai Lama. Um, and it's from sometime after 763, not long after 763. So we have a sort of gap of about 100 years. Okay, and types of old Tibetan texts, we have uh, pillar inscriptions, uh, religious inscriptions on rocks, uh, and graffiti from Ladakh and adjoining areas, and a couple bell inscriptions, which are again from central Tibet. And, and uh, wood slips and paper documents from the fort in Central Asia, of uh, the fort of Miran in Central Asia. Okay, just a word on Tibetan dialects. There's a tendency for the dialects in the middle uh, of Tibet to have developed uh, tone and simplified their syllable structure. And then for dialects on the outskirts to lack tone and have complex uh, syllable structure. And that's normal, right? This is the, 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 the so-called neo-linguists in the 20s and 30s really emphasized that um, more peripheral forms are more archaic, geographically peripheral forms. Uh, th there are various attempts to, to subgroup Tibetan dialects, none of them particularly convincing, so I'm not going to say anything about them. Uh, but one point is old Tibetan, this is very important to me, it's a little bit controversial, old Tibetan is older than common Tibetan. And what do I mean by common Tibetan? I mean, if you reconstructed Tibetan based on all the dialects. Well, how do I know this? Because we know, like, from history, when the Tibetans took over different pieces of the Tibetan plateau and, you know, uh, uh, wider uh, areas, and we know when they invented writing, and they invented writing in 650, basically, right at the beginning of this political project. So um, the form, the sort of uh, state of language pointed to in the orthography is older by a, at least a few decades of uh, older than the presence of Tibetan speakers in most areas. So that means that, uh, not to say it's useless to reconstruct common Tibetan on the basis of, of the dialects, but it's not going to be very useful. It's like Latin, yeah, where, where written Latin preserved in, in uh, philological sources is more archaic than uh, Proto-Romance. Okay. So uh, a look at Old Tibetan phonology. These are the consonant letters and the vowel letters, kind of basic normal Indic sort of system. All of the letters, but this one, uh, the 23rd, are uncontroversial. I think that this 23rd one represents a, a voiced velar fricative. Uh, and a lot of people think that, actually, but a lot of people don't think it. And, and there's, there's a lot of ink has been spilled on this question. And then uh, just to point out that the letter W uh, originally only occurred as a medial. Okay, so now moving to phonology. The script distinguishes voiceless aspirates and uh, plain voiceless obstruents. Uh, so let's say P and PH, uh, but the distinction was not originally phonemic. It sort of starts to become phonemic, but it wasn't originally. Also, um, there are sort of special letters for certain kinds of paddleization. So there's cha for, you know, paralyzed dental and, and so on. Uh, but 
generally speaking, palatalization is written with its own letter. So, for instance, bia, you have a, 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 a b letter and a y letter, but for cha, you have a you have one letter. You don't have a T followed by a Y. And the voiceless L and the voiceless R are spelled differently. So in one case, it's LH. In one case, it's HR. Um, so these are the consonant phonemes. So I've sort of reorganized the consonant letters, gotten rid of these uh, non-phonemic distinctions, and these are the consonant phonemes. Look at phonotactics. Uh, minimal syllable is a C followed by a V. And a maximal syllable is uh, actually four consonants followed by a vowel followed by two more consonants. But of those four consonants, if there are four, the first one has to be a B. Uh, and, and the fourth one has to be a glide. Voicing is distinguished only in the, let's say, pre-glide position or the pre-vocalic position if there's no glide. So if you see something like BSGR, then you say the whole thing was voiced because of the G. So that, so BSGR is BSGR, whereas BSKR would be PSGR. Okay, some changes from Old Tibetan to Classical Tibetan. Aspiration emerges as a uh, distinct but with a small functional load. There's this change of STS to S. So um, let's only look at the third one. To listen is gsan in written Tibetan and is gsan in old Tibetan. And uh, a sort of, um, I don't know what to call it, a, a sporadic use of this final what I think is a velar fricative in Old Tibetan disappears in written Tibetan, which is to say the Old Tibetan forms on the left are, are one option in Old Tibetan. It's not always spelled that way. Uh, but on the right, uh, that's always how the word in question is spelled in, um, in written Tibetan. But this um, character continues into written Tibetan in words uh, with a syllable structure CCV, because it's helping you identify where the vowel is. So, so this is, um, I mean, maybe it's, there's no point in belaboring it, but this is giving you a sort of peek at the controversy surrounding this letter, which is a lot of people think uh, it, it had in the final position, a purely orthographic function in terms of indicating where the vowel is in the syllable. And I think that may well be an accurate description of what goes on in written Tibetan, but the forms on the left show you that it, it's not what happened in Old Tibetan. So I think it, it actually was a, a real phoneme. This is something like the Stambam of the Bodish family, where again, I've taken it very, a very flat uh, analysis because it's never been proven that a Bumtong, Kurtop, Munpa, Zala, and Dakpa have anything in common in terms of a shared innovation. Uh, those languages are all spoken in Bhutan and are referred to as the East Bodish languages. So I will be referring to them as the East Bodish languages, but I don't think there's any reason so far to posit an East Bodish subgroup. Okay, so now we're going to start in on the, the, the historical phonology, working our way backwards. First, Chong's law, which is the assimilation of B to M before nasals. So if we look at a, a, a verb like to kill, which, with, which has a root sat, the past is psat. So you form the past, in this case at least, by putting a B in front of something. But if the verb root starts with an N, like in the verb suppress, then is B changes into an M. So the past tense of suppress is mnand. And similarly, the past tense of listen is mnand. Yeah, so quite normal sort of assimilation, but it makes the verb morphology or the, the verbal system 
look quite complicated because it, it you know, because you have, oh, look, pass can be signaled with a B or it can be signaled with an M. Okay, now Koblenz law, which is, uh, I don't know, sounds a little bit uh, funny, stated, well, yeah, I'll just say it. It's that you lose prefixes when you need to lose the prefixes. Uh, that is to say, only certain things are phonotactically allowed in Old Tibetan. If you had something that was sort of morphologically motivated that would have violated that, you just dropped the prefix. So we'll look at some, um, not all, but some of, of these specifics. Let's uh, start with the past formation. We already mentioned that you form a past uh, verb by putting a B prefix on it. So let's say you have a verb like to do with the root bia, then you would form the past as bia, yeah? But uh, that's phonotactically impossible, so we lose the B. And similarly for sweep, uh, we want the past to be something like bpiax, and then um, we can't do that for phonotactic reasons, so we, we lose the B. It's, let's say, a matter of taste to some extent whether you want to uh, analyze this as a synchronic thing, which is that sort of morphemes don't appear where they would be phonotactically impossible, or a historical thing where you say that like maybe there was a, a vowel there. So at one point in the past, you actually said babyas, and then the vowels uh, disappeared, and then and then that's when it became phonotactically impossible, which is why it was dropped. I think both of those are are options, and uh, just method in terms of what method we're using here, it's internal reconstruction, right? We're we're looking at oddities in the verbal system, and trying to make them not odd, and that's how Koblen, you know, um, th let's say Koblen wrote a very important article in 1979 on the Tibetan verbal system where this is most of the work he was doing. And then uh, similarly, uh, uh, let's say in, I'm simplifying things, but in, tr in intransitive verbs, um, maybe not just in intransitive verbs, but there's a present prefix, which is this, this uh prefix. Uh, and it, it's phonotactically impossible in some cases as well, so it's dropped in Koblenz uh, analysis. Okay. Now I'm going to disagree with one of his proposals, uh, and I think this turns out to be important, where he looked at, uh, let's say, the verb kill again and said, oh, look, it has an O oblaut in the present, and it has a G prefix in the present. Well, maybe the G prefix triggered the O oblaut. And maybe in a verb like to speak, we can say what happened was you had the root zla, you added the prefix ga, like you did in kill. Then the prefix ga triggered the oblaut from a to o, so now you have gzlo. And then because of Koblenz law, the G was lost because it's phonotactically uh, not permitted. And then you're left with zlo. So this is his analysis of the origin of the O oblaut. Putting it you know, another way, um, in those cases where you can have both a G prefix and an O vowel, you have them. And in those places where you can only have an O, but not a G, then you only have the O. And he sees that as a, a change and, ex and explains oblaut as secondary. But if you look um, philologically, there are uh, six examples of verbs where there is no G, although there could have been in the present, but there is still an O. And there's also one example of where there is a G in the present that's not part, not part of the root, and you can tell that because of the imperative, which is the shock at the end, right? It's not that the G is part of the root and it's kept across the paradigm. No, the G is the G that marks the present, uh, but we don't have the O oblaut. So, you know, Koblenz idea that G causes O oblaut is wrong. 
I think that probably, uh, you know, it's not wrong totally, which is to say, you know, at some point there were enough examples of a correlation between G and O that that may have analogically spread. So, so he was, so his analysis was sort of pointing to a moment in the, in the, in the, you know, productive history of morphology in Tibetan, but it's not the original situation. Uh, and then the, you know, the, the point is, this means we, we can't just miss oblaut in the Tibetan verb. And that's very important to me because all uh, historical linguists who work on Tibetan and all, all of them that work on Chinese for that example, ignore all things that look like oblaut. And I don't think that's helpful. Okay, oops. So now on to um, just more sound changes. So this is um, Dempsey's law the merger of e and i before velars. So here are examples with e. The e is preserved in Chinese, right? We saw a very similar change in the history of Burmese. So like, look at number one, you have tech in Chinese, you have chick in uh, Tibetan. And examples with i. You look at the, the word for joint, you have, you know, uh, tsik in Chinese and Sick in Tibetan. Just to point out that this is not such a crazy change. It happened in Latin, as you see if you look at uh, moisten, which is tingo in Latin and tengo in um, Greek. Now we want to look at these changes and understand you know, how old are they? Do are they characteristic of the Bodish branch altogether? or just Tibetan. And um, in the case of Dempsey's law, it's not clear because uh, Kurtop has e in all cases. So let's say it, it seems to have also undergone a merger, whether it's the same merger at the same time is a little unclear. So this, here's the evidence where when Chinese has an e, Kurtop also has an e. For example, in name, where you have meng and meng, uh, Oh, but uh, yeah, oh, but further down on the same slide, if you look at harvest year, Chinese has ing, uh, but Kurtop has neng. So um, yeah, so Kurtop also merged, but not maybe to the same vowel as Tibetan. Now, uh, Dempsey's law would predict that there are no syllables that have the rhyme eng in Tibetan. Why? Because they should have all changed to ing. But if you look around, you find some. So here's seng, and it means purify or clean. And I've done some work to try and kind of explain the etymologies of these, although I, I you know, there's still a lot that I haven't explained. Uh, but here's my attempt with this one. You start with a model. This is uh, the verb to do, so present, past, future, imperative. Bied, bias, bia, bios. We have that in mind as a normal verb, right? And we solve for x, oops, I should have had a line right there, in the following equation. Sorry that this didn't display better. Bie is to bias. Uh, sorry, other way around. Bias, the past, bias, is to bied as basang, which is the past of clean, purify, is to what? And we solve this and we get seng. And that's my analysis of why. Uh, you have this syllable saying is it's an analogical restoration based on uh, forming new presence to inherited pasts. And as evidence that helps me, you know, make this claim, uh, we have uh, an etymologically related uh, verb that's an extension of the inherited present, which is gesing. So to tell it, the story forwards in time, I think there was a time when you had a present gseng and the past uh, basangs, and then gseng changed into gsing according to Dempsey's law. And then that uh, verb was so funny looking, it was too much even for the Tibetans. So they specialized gsing in a slightly different meaning, where it continued to have a life on its own and they restored a new present uh, that sort of violates Dempsey's law, Seng. 
I hope that was, I don't know, uh, clear. Uh, this is my attempt in a sense to show you, I think, how to use historical phonology and analogy as your two tools, right? You sort of make a theory based on uh, historical phonology. You, you say, well, I, I'm a neo-grammarian, so I believe it's an exceptionless change. So that means I have to hunt down every single exception. And then one of the tools I have for explaining those exceptions is analogy. And the most classic you know, form of analogy, although not the only one, is this four-part analogy where you basically say, someone forgot how to say you know, the present of clean in this case, and invented it uh, based on uh, existing structures elsewhere in the language. Okay, that was enough of Dempsey's law. We move on to Benedict's law, which is the palatalization of le to, of, of lia, let's say, to je. Um, field, for instance, where Chinese shows we started with something like ling, sweet or tasty, ground, bow, although it's a little strange that Chinese uses the word arrow for bow. Um, and there's Tibetan internal evidence for this as well. So you look at this, um, so this is Gong Huang Cheng proposed that Tibetan had an honorific infix Y. So you have something like scum uh, means to be dry and you can change it to a skim, the honorific of to be thirsty. And uh, there are pairs and you see them on the screen between L and J. So, you know, his analysis is you have something like lok. Sorry, I should pronounce the S at the final. Loks means side and you want to you know, make it fancy sounding. So you add an L so you get, and, and a G apparently. So you get G L X, but then the sound change makes the L into a J. And so you have G J X. Okay, so that's internal evidence for, um, for this Benedict's uh, law. But an important point is, uh, you know, we still have, or I, I won't get into it, but uh, we, ne we need the little y there as a conditioning environment. I'm, I'm using the little y there to say, this is the conditioning environment for the palatalization. Yeah, okay. And I think there's limited uh, evidence, but real evidence that something similar happened with R. So uh, the best example is definitely this word for day because Burmese has ryak, R-Y-A-K, and Tibetan has jak. So then it looks like the R-Y, like the L-Y, changed into ja. Okay. But what do we do about these words that uh, have a l? I'm actually skipping a logical step. What do we do about words that start with l in a seemingly palatalized environment in general? That's the question. Well, I have an explanation for all of them uh, before ik. So we look at things like island, ling, flute, ling, hunt, ling. And my suggestion is that Benedict's law happened uh, before Dempsey's law. So if we look at field, which turns into jing, and hunt, which is ling, we can do something like say that originally field was ling and hunt was leng. And then uh, Benedict's law came along and changed Ling into Jing. And at that point we had Ling and Leng. Uh, and then Dempsey's law changed Leng into Ling. Uh, I, I'm, I'm worried that that was uh, so too much too quickly, but basically the I vowel is the conditioning or one of the conditioning environments for Benedict's law, right? So in the case of words attested with a L initial that end in ing, we can speculate that at the time of the application of Benedict's law, the, the, the rhyme was not yet ing, it was still eng. And we can do that by proposing that, you know, that um, Dempsey's law had not yet happened when uh, Benedict's law happened. And I think that's, I don't know, one of the things that is one of my sort of um, 
hobbies is to uh, work out relative chronology of sound changes by tricks like this. I just want to point out that tasty is a problem because the Tibetan vowel doesn't match the Chinese vowel. And if you started with lem, it should have been preserved in Tibetan. So there's, so there's something funny going on here. Uh, the Chinese character is quite late attested. I sort of want to believe that they're cognate, but uh, there's a problem here. So did Benedict's law happen in East Bodish? And the answer is no. You know, just look at the, the last uh, word on here, for where Kirtop has ble and Tibetan has bji. So Kirtop did not palatalize the L. Now, uh, Benedict's law doesn't get us all the palatalizations we need. If you look here, we have kick for to tie, fasten, or suffocate. It's not kick, it's kick. And two, we have, let's say, ni in, in Chinese, uh, something like thnik as the proto burmish form. But in Tibetan, we have genis with a nya, not with a na. So why all this palatalization? The easy answer is uh, Tibetan palatalized always before the vowel i. But that doesn't quite work. We have a few examples where there's not palatalization before i. I. And we also have examples where there's palatalization before other vowels. So, so I throw up my hands and just say, you know, there, there are some things we can figure out around Tibetan palatalization, and there are some things we can't at the moment, and it needs more study. Did East Bodish undergo this, this other form of palatalization? And the answer is it did not. So let's look at this one, tree, because we've, we've seen tree in a lot of cases, shing in Tibetan, but seng in Kirtop. So no palatalization. Yeah, and then, um, because we can't explain the origin of, of palatalization, uh, what I do in my reconstructions is I put this little Y in there so that, you know, I, I, I write rather than Xing, I write S Ying, right? Okay, so that was it for palatalization. Now we go on to Conradi's law, which is dental excrescence after this R. Uh, this is again, we're back to the verbal system. So you see, uh, we have a root like so. So so means to nourish, and its present is so. Well, the, the analysis here is the h is the present prefix, but you get an appendices where you don't just say h so, you get h so. That's a way to make, again, the verbal system a little simpler. And then here's an example before voiced uh, consonants. And it also happens before R. So RI is the stem for to write. Um, but the present, uh, sorry, sorry, RI is the root for to write. It comes up in something like a RIMO picture. Uh, but the present is RDRI, where you, there's been a dental inserted, right? This also happens before laterals, but the, but the situation for laterals is is more complicated. And if you're not interested, you can just sort of, you know, daydream for two minutes. Uh, but so we, we start with uh, uh, o, so the, the 23rd letter before L, we get the dental epenthesis exactly like we did in, in the previous cases. But then there's a metathesis. And then Koblen's law means we drop the, the, uh, the initial uh. So you end up with a very funny looking sound change, but it's not so funny looking when you look at it in steps where sort of gamma L changes to LD. But there are examples that, you know, that really make it uh, pretty clear, I think. So chu, the, the root is lad, lad, and the present is ultad. So um, yeah, so it, it, it works in terms of What's, what's going on morphologically is you're just applying this present prefix to the root. Uh, and it tells you that that morphology was productive before all these sound changes happened. And a similar, uh, or at least a component of this change, which is the metathesis of DL to LD, 
also took place in the history of Spanish. Okay, now again, um, just looking at the interaction between these changes, how do Conradi's law and Benedict's law interact? Well, let's look at flee. In the word for flee, the L did not palatalize. So that means that the L was not in right before the I vowel when Benedict's law happened. So I think it went something like this. You had ba. Then you got the dental appendices. ba. Uh, then you got the um, with the metathesis. And then it's the D that paralyzes and not the L. So you can tell that um, the excrescence of Conradi's law occurred before metathesis. And so uh, Conradi's law must precede Benedict's law. And that's one reason you can see, you know, that I'm going backwards in time. I talked about Benedict's law first. Now I've talked about Conradi's law. And now I've shown that Conradi's law has to be before Benedict's law. Okay, now Bodman's law, this is a fun one. ML changes to MD, uh, which gets you some really nice uh, Sino-Tibetan cognates, in particular arrow, where Old Burmese has Mla and Tibetan has Mda. So we can just say that Tibetan originally had Mla. Yeah? Also for fathom, uh, I, that means the span of distance, right? One fathom, it doesn't mean the verb to think. So, um, you have lam in Burmese, solem in uh, Chinese, and we probably have malom as the prehistoric form in Tibetan. Okay. There's also Tibetan internal evidence for Bodman's law, as we see in um, this this ensemble of words having to do with blindness. So we have madongs, ledong, and long. So that, that makes it clear that it's quite reasonable to think that there's a lateral at play in the root that has to do with blindness. And, and you get different outcomes different depending on the different uh, prefixes. Yeah. Okay, how about Bodman's law in East Bodish? Well, it didn't happen. So, so far, East Bodish has not participated in any of these uh, sound changes, I just want to point out. Yeah, so, uh, so the mumpa word for arrow is mla, just like in Burmese. Yeah. Okay, so now a look at uh, Bodman's law and Conradi's law. So if Conradi's law occurred after M, Bodman's law can be seen as a subcase of Conradi's law. It's dental apenthesis, right? Uh, because of the L. Uh, and then you could have metathesis, and then you could have Koblen's law that deletes uh, the L, but I don't like this explanation, and the reason why is because then we have, in some cases, Koblen's law is deleting the the r, the prefix, uh, but in other cases, it's deleting the l. Yeah, so I don't like that. So I would rather choose to analyze Bodman's law and Conradi's law as unrelated. But I just wanted to say, you know, some people have done it this way, and you might be tempted to do it this way. Okay, now uh, a exciting little change, which is that uba changes into wa. And this actually allows us to get rid of all medial w's in Old Tibetan. So you notice that um, all Old Tibetan words that have a medial w have it before the vowel a ah, without, without anything fi following. So this, uh, I mean, this isn't good motivation for this proposal, but it is a consequence of this proposal, right? If you changed uba into wa, then you would only get wa in, uh, in, in this circumstance, which would say open syllables where the vowel is a. Okay. But also uh, this proposal explains the alternations that we see between a root that's, that has u and, uh, and the medial w form. So let's just look at horn. There are two words for horn in Tibetan, ru and rwa. It tends to be that the shorter form happens in compound. 
and this is also true of let's say uh like, like there are two words for hand one is lock in compound and one is lock pa uh as a free morphe or as a free word uh so this would make this wa have exactly the same function as this ba or pa nominalizing uh, suffix so i think it's a it's a brilliant analysis that uh, guillaume jacques and uh, Nishi, uh, Nishida, rather, have come up with. Okay, now on to just another change. Continue going backwards in time. Uh, some of the Ys in Tibetan seem to come from uh, W. So, for instance, the the verb to be is yin in Tibetan, and it's wen in Kurtop. I think that's the that's the best example. But let's look at dog as well. We have ki in um, in Tibetan, and you have kui in uh, Kurtop. So which Ws changed into Ys? Was it before the vowel i? Well, then you don't get the weed example, but the weed example maybe isn't such a great example to begin with. It's not totally clear to me. Uh, but you do also get, let's say, a YY correspondence between Tibetan and Kurtop, which just proves that it's a merger, right? So. Kurtop distinguishes ya and wa in these cases, and Tibetan doesn't. So I'll just sum up and say th there's something that I think is kind of cool here, which is here, this sound change gets rid of all the medial Ws in old, old Tibetan. But this sound change gives us some initial Ws that we didn't have. So, so our reconstructed language is starting to have a very different uh, sort of uh, phonotactics than old Tibetan. Okay, Laufer's law is that uh, basically labiovelars and labial uvulars induce a, 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 an O vowel. So this explains a lot of cognates to um, Chinese, and I will point you to um, the third one. So you have uh, uh, grot in uh, Tibetan and kwa uh, in Chinese for stomach. Um, okay, the R is a problem, but otherwise they're pretty similar looking words for stomach, and this proposal helps bring them closer together. It also, I think, indirectly helps confirm uh, the, um, the reconstruction of uh, labiovelars and labial uvulars in Old Chinese, which I can put another way as it would be reason enough to reconstruct uh, labiovelars and labial uvulars in the history of Chinese just to make correspondence is externally better, but we also have a lot of internal reason for doing it. Okay, the word for bear is a problem though, where we have an O in it, in Tibetan, but there's no O in Kurtop, there is an O in Munpa, it's kind of confusing, no O in Chinese, no O in uh, Burmese, so it seems like the, you know, the root, if you like, is something like Wam, um, but uh, it should have a, uh, should have a G at the beginning in Tibetan if it were to work perfectly, right? Because you because you would say, oh, it's this labio uvular uh, in Chinese that uh, changes to a W in Burmese. That's totally regular. The schwa changes to an A. Uh, so this predicts a form gom in Tibetan, and you don't get gom, you get dom. It's a problem. Uh, but the same correspondence uh, to me seems to come up in the word for wing. Although uh, I think most other investigators don't think these two words are cognate. Okay, there are other or or origins of O, which is to say Tibetan has a lot of O's. Yeah, Tibetan has a lot of O's uh, and they have a lot of origins. So uh, AW is one which you, which you, you see that uh, in, in Chinese it's AW, in, in Tibetan it's O. So now we've gotten to uh, proto bodish and I would say in approximate order of changes, we have Laufer's law, W goes to Y, Uva goes to W, Bodman's law, Conradi's law, Benedict's law, Dempsey's law, Koblen's law, Chong's law. And then conclusions about what proto bodish looked like. Uh, it had a wider distribution of L. Uh, Tibetan W is always secondary, uh, but uh, there were some initial Ws 
in total boat issue, but they weren't intermittent. This is an, an oversimplification uh, based on Nancy Kaplow's dissertation uh, that Gong Shun has some issues with, and I think he's probably right, but um, uh, Gong, but he hasn't published his, um, he has published a clear statement. So we'll just go with Nancy Kaplow's presentation. Uh, there's the ba that is on verbs, and there's the ba that is on nouns, and both of them I don't know, are traditionally seen as some kind of nominalization, but in the case of verbs, it clearly is a nominalization because it changes something from being a verb to a verbal noun. Whereas in, um, in nouns, it just sort of helps the noun be used as a free word, right? Like lock means hand, lock pa means hand. It hasn't, it, there's no nominalization going on there, um, but, there but there is a, a suffix. So when you teach Tibetan, you treat these as basically the, the same kind of suffix. Uh, but their tonal effects in uh, Tibetan dialects are different. So, um, you know, so if you were uh, sloppy, you would say, oh, well, you know, uh, ba behaves differently in verbs than it does in nouns. Whereas if you're a neogrammarian, what you would say is that, that those tonal differences that have something to do with the accent system in, um, in uh, Old Tibetan uh, were there in the proto language, uh, or yeah, in the what the, I I I mean, it, were there in common to them? And uh, in I I don't have the the information in front of me, but uh, one clear example also is um, is um, uh, na, which can mean in or if in Tibetan. Yeah, so it means in on nouns and it means if on verbs. Uh, um, Gong Shun, actually, this is part, part of his discussion, has shown that they, they across all Tibetan dialects, they have different tonal effects. So you can you can show that there are, that there are you know, two different morphemes. So anyhow, that's why I put that accent there, was to say, you know, it's this ba, not the other one. at the risk of, of sounding like a hypocrite, you can understand the change as uba did not change into wa in verbs. That's not neogrammarian, uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a helpful mnemonic, yeah? Um, what, what, it, what you could say if you're a neogrammarian is um, that either it's a different ba suffix, which is what I was saying, or you could say that uh, it did change. So uh, 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 a verb like to steal was originally rkuba, and then it changed it to rkwa. But then rkwa looked so aberrant in the verbal system overall, and there was a ton of analogical pressure being exerted on it that rkuba was restored and uh, rkwa was lost without a trace. That's, you know, which is to say I have two stories I can tell and both of them are neogrammarian. We don't have evidence independent of the kind of stuff that Nancy Kaplow and Shun Gong are talking about. And I would say that it, it, it manifests in the tonal systems of, uh, of the central dialects, but is related to ac uh, accent stuff, word level accent in the non-tonal languages. So it's, it was probably some kind of let's say barely phonemic word accent uh, system in, in the level of kind of, 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 of Old Tibetan synchronically. Now we're going to head further back in time from, um, from Proto-Bodish to Proto-Trans Himalayan. Li Fang Kui's law, this is one of the real exciting laws in all of the Sino-Tibetan family, if you ask me, which is that rya changes to rgya. And uh, one of the, let's say the, the best example maybe is the word for hundred where Tibetan has brgya and Burmese has rya. So uh, Li Fang Kui said, well, yeah, it's maybe the G is empathetic. There, there are uh, typological parallels for this too that are in my book. Uh, those of you, so aside to those of you who have noticed it, 
Uh, am I proposing that RY becomes two different things? One is RGYA and one is ZHA? The answer is sort of, uh, but I think we need to index the difference. So, uh, so I discussed that in, 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 in my book. Uh, okay, and now about the timing of Li Feng Kui's law, and this is a real mystery, which is why I present it to you. On the one hand, there's evidence that it was sort of just happening as Tibetan enters history. So Udiana, which in some kind of um, uh, new Indo-Aryan uh, would have been the da would have been an R, so something like Uriana becomes Urgyan in Tibetan. So it's a loan word where they've inserted a G. That means it's a new change. And then there's this uh, word for a divination board that in Old Tibetan, there, the orthography is unstable, even in a single document, between Ryax and Ryax. So that really makes it seem like we can see this sound change happening before our eyes. But bizarrely, other Bodic languages seem to have undergone the change. So Kurtop word for eight is jat, and in 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 Munpa the word for eight is get. So the G is definitely there. Now you could try and get around this. You could say that uh, the the East Bodic languages borrowed their numeral system from Tibetan. Yeah, it could be, but that seemed a little bit ad hoc. So it's a real contradiction. Uh, there's evidence that Li Fang Kui's law is really new. And there's evidence that Li Feng Kui's law is really old, and I don't know how to solve that problem. Ah, now uh, Sakya Pandita's law, uh, which is that uh, G changed to D before graves and D changed to G before acutes. Now, as a synchronic fact, uh, Tibetan D and G as pre initials are in complementary distribution. So you could reconstruct there as being only one source. But uh, Sakya Pandita's law, and this is kind of Jacques' interpretation of it, uh, um, is that D and G were, were originally separate and have collapsed. Uh, and so the best uh, evidence for this is the word for ant, where um, <clears throat> so, so Jacques says there's a G prefix in animal names. And he says, oh, look, there's ant, there's leopard, there's eagle. You all know that I have a certain amount of skepticism around animal prefixes, but fine, I'm I'm okay with this, um, um, and I'll just point out actually that the 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 word ant works extremely nicely uh, in terms of you have a uvular in um, in Gyarong, um, and then you have an R initial which could come from a uvular in in Burmese. Uh, the point here is that. In Tibetan, you could have a D there. You could, you if the word for ant were drok, you could have written drok, but it wasn't. The word was grok. Um, so then um, maybe the maybe in leopard and eagle, the G is original, even though you couldn't have a D there. Uh, and then he similarly thinks that, that in body parts, uh, the, there's there's a D prefix. So in I and in, in hip uh, is evidence. So anyhow, that's Sakya Pandita's law. And now uh, Houghton's law. Um, so Houghton's law is another kind of paddleization. So this is our third kind of paddleization, but this one's really old. And it only affects velar nasals. And it doesn't affect all velar nasals. So, so again, the, the conditioning environment for the palization is hard to pinpoint. But how do I know it's so old? It's because in this case, the East Bodish languages share it. So, so East Bodish languages don't participate in Benedict's law, and they don't participate in the, the overall palization in Tibetan, uh, but they do participate in, in Houghton's law. So the word for fish, which, you know, remember in Burmese and Chinese is Nga, basically. Well, in Kurtop and in Tibetan, it's Nya. So, um, yeah, so, so now we have our first isogloss that proves that Bodish is a family, if you like. Okay. Uh, but uh, gums, which I have treated as an example of, of, of Houghton's law, because it starts with a velar nasal in, in uh, Chinese and uh, Burmese, uh, it has a dental nasal in, in Kurtop. 
which is to say maybe I'm wrong to treat gums as an instance of Houghton's law. Maybe it's actually uh, this, sec this other later palatalization. Okay. And now my, my all-time you know, favorite sound change that, uh, that other people don't believe, Guillaume Jacques in particular, is that I think as changes into os in the history of Tibetan, and that this, that evidence for this is in two uh, weird uh, verb conjugations. So it has the conjugation za, zos, bza, zo, uh, and chu has, is cha, chos, cha, cho. Okay, so the o oblaut in the imperative is totally regular, don't worry about it. But having an O oblaut in the past, it's bizarre. It only occurs in these two words. And these two words, I would point out, have certain uh, phonetic things in common. They're uh, open syllable root in A. So my proposal is that as changed into os. Now that means, I, uh, oh yes, first, this proposal does a lot of work for me, which I'm very happy about. Uh, where, okay, you say, well, Nathan, why didn't uh, us change to us in the past tense of to look at? You have lita, bletas, bleta, letos as to look at. And I would say it did. And that's why we have a verb letos, which means to, to look to or to attend to. And then what happened was, uh, in, in that case, because the verb was less frequent, if you like, uh, the that irregular past went off and formed its own new verb, and then blatas was analogically restored, and I would tell the same story about the other two verbs here. So I think this as to os uh, is already doing a lot of work for us. Yeah. And then you say, well, you know, uh, what about all these other verbs? You know, um, so bie, bias, bia, bios. Why isn't it bie, Bios, bia, bios. I would say analogy, right? There's going to be a huge amount of analogical pressure to undo the sound change. And we even see that happening uh, in historic times with the verb to eat, where bizas replaces zos. Yeah. And uh, if you're skeptical, you say, okay, fine. You say there was an exceptional sound change uh, that, that if they changed all asses into os, uh, but it's the only direct evidence is in two verbs and indirect evidence in another three verbs, it just seems awfully speculative, Nathan. But then I'll point out that kurtope, which usually has a as the cognate of a, in the words do, borrow, eat, and devour has u. So this suggests to me that this as os change happened uh, on the way from Trans-Himalayan to Proto-Bodish, and it's shared by uh, 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 proto uh, by by Kurtop and Tibetan, and that's why you get it, you know, in exactly these words. So I think this is beautiful. I think it's really really nice. Um, so uh, the only well, so Bettina Seisler doesn't like it, and you can read her reply to my article. Uh, but I have a little trouble following what she's trying to say. Um, Guillaume Jacques doesn't like it because he thinks this ato o ablav is related to um, a, the agreement system, which he thinks it's sort of evidence of the agreement system. And, and his, you know, his solution works in a sense. It, it can explain why it's retained in, in Kurtov and in Tibetan. Uh, whereas as far as I can tell, Seisler's uh, explanation will not get you the Kurtov forms. Uh, but I don't think, uh, like, I, you know, I, I like Guillaume, uh, uh, want to see uh, agreement morphology in the history of these languages, but I just think Occam's razor says, you know, look, we this is a problem we were able to solve with um, with uh, 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 exceptionalist phonology and analogy. So let's just leave it there. Uh, that's my feeling. Okay, now on to uh, Schiefner's law, which is that z changes to z. Schiefner, and I think this is one of the earliest uh, sound laws uh, that has been proposed. Um, in terms of the history of the discipline. Uh, he said, well, look at the future of this verb. Uh, so we have zuk in the present, bzuk in the past, zuks in the imperative, and we have zuk in the future. It would be nice if instead it were g zuks. Sorry, g zuk. So that's his uh, internal reconstruction. 
uh, and there's there's other sort of internal etymological um, evidence for it. So we look at zong, which means merchandise. It looks like it has some relationship to uh, the verb to sell, which is song. Um, but it would look even more like that if it started with a D. The comparative evidence for Schiefner's law. So you see it there, you know, with eat, with bridge, with quarrel. It's really pretty impeccable, I think, that that Z changed to Z in certain phonotactic positions in um, in Tibetan. Now let's just look at this verb to see sort of, you know, Tibetan historical phonology as told by the story of one verb. So the current conjugation is zin, bzung, guzung, zungs. So I think we started with something like h, zung, d, b, zung, d, zung, d, zung. And then in with Schiefner's law, we get r, zung, d, b, zung, d, zung, zungs. Then I didn't talk about this change, but uh, in the present, you get this u to e change, which is sort of somehow triggered by the, the final d. Uh, and then you get an assimilation of the ng to the d. And then you get Sakya Pandita's law. And that's what changes the d prefix in the future to a g prefix. And then you get Conradi's law, where we restore the d, right? Because uh, because you see that we we changed the the z to a z from Schiefner's law, but then Conradi's law we stick the d back in the the dental excrescence after the prefix r. Okay, now how about Schiefner's law in East Bodish? Well, it's there. You see that we have a za in these words in Tibetan, and we have a za in these words in Kirtup and Monpa, which is, which is to say, I think we're starting to build up some pretty good evidence that there really is such a node as Bodish. Uh, they, they share Schiefner's law, Houghton's law, and this very particular os to os change. Okay, now Simon's law, which is that mr changes to br. This is a very helpful um, sound change in improving Sino-Tibetan etymology, and let's look at the second and third example. The word for a female yak in Tibetan is, well, brimo, brimo, and in Chinese, it's mru, probably a loan word from Tibetan, yeah, but an early one before uh, Simon's Law. Uh, so, um, yeah, so there's uh, some example, there's an example. And um, well, I, let's not look at nomad because it's also kind of too Tibetan specific, but rather be where we have a word for fly mrung in, um, in Chinese. And this change allows us to reconstruct smrang in, in Tibetan. So those start to, so Simon's law does a lot of work for us in terms of improving Sino-Tibetan comparisons. Yeah. And how about Simon's law in East Bodish? Yeah, I would, I really wanted to be there, but I just, the East Bodish languages are extremely poorly documented. You know, I've I've gotten all these cognates from just sort of articles about totally different subjects. Yeah, um, there's there's no good you know Kurtob dictionary or Munpa dictionary or big fat grammars. Uh, so you know the information is just not there. Sorry. Now there are some exceptions to Simon's law, which is to say there are words that have M followed by R in them, which you shouldn't, which you don't want, right? If M cha if MR changed to BR, then you don't want to see uh, MR in Tibetan. But there are these words. Uh, none of them seem to have good Simon Tibetan cognates. Uh, I don't know how to explain them. And now um, a proposal of uh, Jacques which is that rlya changed to rja. This is quite similar to, or to other stuff we've seen in Tibetan, let's say, to, um, uh, to uh, it's, a, it's a kind of, um, it, let's say, it's particularly similar to Bodman's law, right? Because uh, we're getting a, 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 a fortition of a lateral. Uh, and here's some evidence of it. The only reason I put it sort of this far back in time, if you like, is because I think that the evidence is not super strong. 
Okay, now the merger of a and u, this should be pretty familiar by now. Uh, you know, Chinese has a and Tibetan has a in words like armor and shell compared to each other, or hill and hill, or five. Uh, but there are other cases where Tibetan has a and uh, Chinese has a schwa. Like weave, we've already talked about in the, in the history of Burmese. So uh, Tibetan merges e and a before dentals, including r and l. We can say before acutes, if you like. Um, a change that also happened in Burmese, right? So here are examples with e. So Tibetan has, Tibetan and Burmese have a in the word for eight, but Chinese has e. Uh, Tibetan Burmese have a in the word for cut, but Chinese has e. Some people instead want to reconstruct this as a ya in Sino-Tibetan that changes to e in uh, Old Chinese. I don't like that proposal as much, I think because it complicates the phonotactics of the proto-language. Um, but, you know, maybe it's right. Okay, and then um, here are examples with, with a. Okay, there are two words where Tibetan sort of, let's say, has kept the E where we don't expect it to. One is to increase and one is sleet. Now in to increase, I could tell you a story about analogy, although it would, uh, it would end up being a complicated story. Uh, but bas basically that, you know, one way or another, we, we analyze the verb as a present tense verb and so we stick the e back in it, uh, but that's not going to work for hail. So I don't know how to explain these. Okay, now Pieros and Starosin's law, and we're getting so far enough back in time that you're seeing, you know, laws you've seen uh, discussed for other languages. Uh, Tibetan merges uh, uvulars and velars. These examples are uvulars, where Chinese preserve the uvular and Burmese drops it. And these examples are velars, where all three languages have velars. Lovely, huh? There's one exception where we have uh, this, this velar, voice velar fricative instead of a G in Tibetan. I don't know why, but I think it's probably something phonota phonotactic because a, a, um, a word gong, just G-O-N-G, -G, gong would look really odd to me in Tibetan. And I, I had trouble putting my finger on why it looks odd, but it, would, it seems odd. Um, so I think this might have a, a, a kind of later Tibetan internal explanation, but I don't know. And then also we've mentioned bear before, but now it's coming up in the context of, of uvulars, uh, which is we have a reason to reconstruct the uvular in uh, Chinese, and that's consistent with what happens in Burmese, but we have a dental in, in Tibetan for some reason. Now there is evidence in other places, including Tongut, which I didn't include here, but uh, Situ Gyarong has the wam for bear. So, you know, I, so one thing you might say, and I think this is probably what Guillaume says, is that actually uh, the, the Chinese word didn't actually start with the uvular here, Baxter and Cigar wrong, it started with an initial W. I, I would rather not complicate, again, the phonotactics of the proto language that much just for this one example, but maybe that's the answer. Um, and, and, then, and then you could basically see the Tibetan form as going back to something like the Situ Gyarong form with, uh, ver the, with the syllables being smashed together. Okay. And then here's a correspondence we've seen before, which is uh, uh, U and U. We, you know, U in Tibetan, U in, in Chinese, we reconstruct as U. O in Tibetan, O in Chinese, we reconstruct as O. But U in Tibetan, Oh no! Wait, uh, I've, it's a, just a mistake on the on the slide. I have it right in the title. U in Tibetan and O in Chinese. I reconstruct this um, schwa W. I feel like this is a very tentative solution, but its advantages, uh, as mentioned on a different day, are that it fills a gap in Old Chinese, uh, and it's only called for in those situations where you also have things like ow and u in Chinese. Problems are that the schwa w examples outnumber the o examples, which seems unlikely to me. And that if ow and u merge to o in Tibetan, we would expect uh, schwa w to merge. 
uh, to O in Tibetan, where it doesn't, it merges into U. So we've, we've seen uh, this argument before. In any case, here are examples that can be uh, reconstructed U, including after birth, an uncle, a nine, an elbow. And here are examples that can be reconstructed O, sharp, relaxed, servant. And then here are the, re the words that can be reconstructed as schwa W, so steel, bend, meat. Now uh, on to our next change, uh, Tibetan loses final Y. We've also touched on this before. Um, here are some examples. So, so net or trap, something like ria, whereas you have rai in, in Chinese. And then uh, sometimes, I don't even know if I formulated this, this observation correctly, but sometimes in these words where you would have expected a final Y, uh, Tibetan has an E vowel instead of an A vowel. And is this some kind of condition change because of the Y? It's not clear to me. It, maybe it's oblaut that's, that's inherited from the proto-language. It's not clear, it needs to be solved. And in two words, uh, Tibetan has a D, which I guess we have to assume is some kind of suffix. It's not there in, uh, in uh, Chinese or Burmese. Okay, and then RL changes to L. I mean, this is a definitional thing, right? Where Chinese has an R, Burmese has nothing, and Tibetan has L, I reconstruct RL. So these are the examples, we've seen them before. And there are ambiguities between RL and R, where uh, Chinese has R, but Tibetan has both L and R. And um, particularly this word for neck, it, it, it needs philological work. You know, maybe it's a one-off, maybe it's borrowing inside of a dialect, or maybe it's old and interesting, it needs work. And then uh, origins of final H, uh, or let's say final R, um, and, and this is one reason why I think it's real and not just an orthographic nicety, uh, is that it's cognate with K in, um, in Chinese. And as you know, and this is a solution I feel uncomfortable with, I reconstruct this as a K followed by a schwa in words like 100 and arrow and pass. Uh, and I think it's, it's, this is my defense of my reconstruction, is that then uh, you could have this sequence of changes where you have lenition uh, and then uh, apocope leaving the R in Tibetan, and in, in Chinese, you could have the basically the apocope before the uh, uh, lenition. Okay, there are some exceptions where Tibetan has this final uh, re, and Chinese has a ya instead of a k. I don't know how to explain it. And then here's another exception where uh, where Chinese doesn't have anything, but Tibetan has a final a. Uh. And then uh, also. Uh, the K and Q um, collapse as, it's written as a G, but it was pronounced as a K in Tibetan. So here are examples that we can reconstruct as with a final K. So night, uh, for instance, or day, you know, a 24 hour period in Tibetan cognate with night in, in Chinese, both something like a rak, and then one, uh, both going back to something like tech. Okay, and then here are the examples with Q where Tibetan has a final ka, and Chinese has a final gold stop. And then the last topic, and oh, I don't really have time for it, but I'll try and plow ahead, is the age of voicing alternation and oblaut in Tibetan, where basically I just want to say that most people think these are late and I think they're early. So someone like uh, uh, Randy Lapola or Mei Tzu Lin think that uh, voicing alternation is due to, to segmental prefixes, and that you have some very simple, like voiced is intransitive, voiceless is transitive. That is just not the picture in Tibetan. And it hasn't been the picture, well, I, I've <laughs> written the date is 1593, it's actually 1953, which is still a long time ago, uh, since Ure pointed this out in, in 1953. We have three types of verbs. Um, we, we have the, the A voiced, uh, the, the B voiceless transitive, and then we have a, 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 sorry, I'll just say this again. I'm trying to rush, but I shouldn't. Um, we have type A, which is a voiced intransitive. We have type V, which is a voicing alternating, voice alternating transitive. And when, then we have a voiceless intransitive as well. 
the C forms, I won't talk through the details, seem to be derived from the B forms. And then here are, are examples. I'll just talk you through the first one. Uh, so you have grol, voice throughout the paradigm, to be free. Grol, with voice alternation inside the paradigm, to liberate. And crawl uh, with voiceless throughout the paradigm, un unravel. So the first one and the third one are intransitive, and the the transitive one is the voice alternating one. So just this picture has not been grasped by the Sino-Tibetanists, if you like. They've seen a much more uh, simplified picture, uh, and it has never been uh, sufficiently addressed. Um, I'll run through this and just say, you know, that's my argument that voicing alternation is old in Tibetan and needs to be handled at, at it needs to be handled at the Sino-Tibetan level uh, because no one has handled it at the Tibetan level, even though some people have thought they, they did. And similarly for Abla, and I've sort of looked at this uh, already a little bit, that this G causes A to O, I don't believe it. Um, and then there's there's also this idea that, that a D suffix uh, causes uh, A to E. Um, and I just want to point out that I think there's evidence for oblaut already back in Sino-Tibetan. So we have to know in, in Tibetan is makan, and then to see is ken in Chinese. Uh, we have uh, to see is matong in Tibetan, and it's marang, which probably comes from matang in um in Burmese. We have to read, originally to chant in Tibetan, uh, which has the, the very exciting paradigm, clock black, clock clock. And it, um, uh, its cognate in, in Chinese is lok, which looks like the present, right? So, which is to say, I think there's some kind of oblaut uh, going on at the Sino-Tibetan level. And that is uh, something that I wasn't really able to address very well in my book, other than to just point out that I think it's real. Um, and, and you don't even need Tibetan to show it. That's what, like, I think the Ablaut is most robust in Tibetan of these three languages, but there, there is evidence just looking at Chinese and Burmese, and even just within Chinese. So voicing alternation and Ablaut are old, and people need to take them seriously, which they haven't so far. And then I won't talk you through this one uh, because I'm already over time, but it's just a summary of the changes that, that I've already discussed. And so transitive land from a Tibetan perspective had distinct uvulars and velars, had a six vowel, had no powels, had no voice fricatives. And from the Tibetan perspective, the glide ya, or let's call it the feature of palization, occurred uh, after velar nasals, la and ra. Okay, that's it.